that shield is complicated, to say the least. That shield should be destroyed. This world is ours. Two thousand years ago, ancient civilizations such as the Roman Empire in the west and the Han Dynasty in the east had risen to prominence. In the modern Middle East, the Parthian Empire ruled ancient Persia and the surrounding regions from their main capital at Ctesiphon. These cultures are known to us as being almost unfathomably ancient, but what was ancient to them? 6,000 years ago, 4,000 years before Augustus created the Roman Empire, one of the first true urban settlements emerged in the ancient region of Sumer. Its people's accomplishments sowed the seeds for civilization to spread, first to the ancient Near East and then the entire world. Welcome to our series on the ancient Near East, beginning with the period from Uruk to Akkad. Beginning in the aftermath of the last ice age, 10,000 years ago, the human population of Mesopotamia and several other regions gradually began to adopt a more settled mode of living. This was a lifestyle which contrasted with the earlier ways in which humans had survived, most commonly by functioning as hunter-gatherers. They would begin to cultivate, modify, plant and harvest crops in the earliest forms of agriculture and herd animals. Many humans gradually began to live in this manner in small village communities, while others retained their primal hunter-gatherer lifestyle. However, over the thousands of years following the glacial retreat, agricultural lifestyles increased in popularity. In ancient Mesopotamia, the increased surpluses of food generated by agricultural production would soon lead to the blossoming of civilization's first seeds. At this point, it is important to detail the unique geographical and environmental state of Mesopotamia and to understand how this affected the development of civilization there. The name itself literally means land between rivers, specifically the Tigris and Euphrates. The latter of these watercourses was given the name Burinum by the native Sumerians, a word meaning great rushing flood a phenomenon which would define the relationship of the native people with their gods and land. Consequently, many prominent Mesopotamian deities such as Enlil, the chief god of the pantheon, were related to wind, air and storms. The faithful of Sumer would seek to appease these gods to stave off the common devastating and inexplicable flash floods which struck the region made worse by the flat nature of the Tigris-Euphrates plain. For instance, on one occasion in Sumerian myth, Enlil destroyed all of humanity with a flood simply because they were too noisy, showing the arbitrary and often capricious nature of the Mesopotamian gods. Early village settlements in the land between rivers required most or all of the population to be engaged in the production of food. This was known as the Ubaid period, which lasted from around 6500 to 3800 BC, of which Eridu is a prominent settlement. However, the increasing food surplus allowed the maintenance of full-time specialized workers who were not engaged in agriculture, such as merchants, weavers, metallurgists and craftsmen. It is worth noting that the taxation and redistribution of food supplies led to the formation of governments. The first true city of the Mesopotamian area is disputed, but most historians believe that it was the famous urban centre at Uruk, whose urban way of life was indisputably superior to all of its surrounding contemporaries. Huge buildings were present, as well as social hierarchy, high officials and temple-sponsored craft workshops. This early city developed a stratified society and was initially not ruled by a king as we know them, but as a high priest of the temples. There were two of these temple complexes in Uruk, the Iana district and the older Anu district. This proto-king's power was derived from his leading role in the temple itself representing the various gods and goddesses of Sumer. 
just below the priest king in status were the keepers, scribes, priests and administrators whose activities were meant to ensure the community's organization and cohesion. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the producers, such as farmers and fishermen. The very first systems of writing also developed in this period, possibly as a memory aid for the recording of tributes, taxes and distributions of surplus food, and were mainly based on simple symbols rather than representing a spoken language. From 3500 BC onwards, the influence of Uruk over the surrounding areas became increasingly clear to see. The buildings of the ascendant city and its iconic and pioneering mass-produced pottery and tools also found themselves in settlements all across the Near East from Syria to Iran, such as Susa. The people who brought them probably settled in existing towns with existing populations, made colonies of their own on unoccupied land, or even invaded other settlements violently from their dominant position in Uruk. The latter phenomenon occurred at Tel Hamukar, where native architecture was burned and destroyed, followed by the construction of buildings in the Uruk style, the earliest noted occurrence of organized warfare. The pseudo-colonial effort may have been attempted in order to obtain resources which were not present in resource-poor Mesopotamia, such as wood, obsidian, stone or metals, rather than it being a conscious effort to forge an empire. Attesting to the far-reaching nature of Uruk's civilization at this time, it is also thought that they had a presence in Egypt as well, whose tombs in the pre-dynastic period began to be constructed in the Uruk niche and buttress style. However, around the year 2900 BC, it seems that the Uruk colonies, such as Habuba Kabira, abruptly disappear from outside southern Mesopotamia. Meanwhile, Uruk itself appears to have been raised in some devastating event and gradually lost its hegemonic status. We do not know exactly what happened to end the Uruk period, but it could have been that those colonized individuals rebelled against Uruk, or a civil war occurred between different factions in the city. Over the centuries following the decline of Uruk, a number of Sumerian city-states emerged and grew in size. This created a political map which would have appeared similar to ancient Greece and its network of city-states. The city-states mostly consisted of an urban center and a hinterland consisting of various villages. Examples of such city-states included Lagash, Uma, Ur, Nippur, Eridu, Lhasa and Uruk itself, which retained its power but not its hegemony. In the centuries from 2900 to around 2350 BC, known as the Early Dynastic Period, the population of Sumer grew dramatically, possibly due to immigration from other regions or increasing agricultural productivity. This strained the resources of the various city-states and necessitated territorial expansion, leading to continuous intercity conflicts over border regions. The military leaders during these small-scale wars were often elected by a popular assembly in a form of primitive democracy, though this soon unraveled into a dynastic system. These military leaders are said to have been the first kings, or lugals, literally great men. Also in this period, another dominant structure emerged to rival the temple, the palace, House of Kings. The iconic Gilgamesh is thought to have been a historical king of Uruk in the early dynastic period, possibly reigning around 2800 to 2500 BC, though the tale also could have been based on a mythical figure. We have a documented account of one of the many border conflicts over a 150 year period from 2500 to 2350 BC. The kings of Lagash, wealthy on account of their prosperous agriculture and position on a trade route to Susa, wrote their accounts of a continuous border conflict with their western neighbor, the city of Uma. Owing to the prominence of agriculture in the economies of ancient Mesopotamia, these two rival city-states engaged in a conflict over the region of Guadena, which was rich in fields and pastulans. One victorious king, Ernatum of Lagash, 
portrayed himself as a champion of his respective local god. Ningursu of Lagash and Sharu of Uma were depicted as the lords of the conflict, using the kings of the various cities as their deputies. It is interesting to note that this initial borderland between Uma and Lagash was reportedly drawn by Enlil of Nippur, the supreme god, and this again indicates his prominence in Mesopotamian religion. Due to the amount of victory inscriptions by the kings of Lagash during this period, it can be inferred that they were dominant. While the temple had largely lost its political dominance over Sumerian city-states to the kings at this point, the economic and ideological position of the temple remained strong. They were a total institution, comprising spaces dedicated to the gods, only accessible by high priestly officials, courtyards for communal gatherings, storehouses for the accumulation and distribution of food surpluses, archives and workshops. Another example of the ideological dominance of religion is that while the king would lead the military action, the outcome would be credited to and determined by the will of the city god. The concept of city gods is worth further discussion. During this time of relative equilibrium between the many city-states of Lower Mesopotamia, each political entity housed one of the Sumerian gods. For instance, Ur was the home of Nana, god of the moon and wisdom, while Uruk housed Inanna, goddess of war and fertility. Most prominent was the long-lasting city of Nippur, which sat on the border between Sumer and Akkad to the north. Its patron god was Enlil, considered as the supreme god of the Mesopotamian pantheon. Many prospective kings of cities such as Ur, containing lesser gods, commonly sought the recognition of Nippur due to its prominent religious position. The period of labyrinthine diplomatic and military relations between the many Sumerian city-states gradually began to give way to additional centralization in the region by the late 3rd millennium BC. Why this happened is not known, but it is possible that the rulers in this period had heard of the now unified Old Kingdom of Egypt, which ruled the entirety of the Nile River Valley and built the famous pyramids, and wished to emulate their power and wealth. For a century and a half, Umar had been humbled by their more powerful neighbour of Lagash, but this was soon to change. A dynamic new ruler, Lugal Zagesi, ascended to the kingship in Umar and began to expand his realm, hungering for revenge against Lagash. He first conquered the prominent cities of Ur and Uruk before defeating his rival, sacking the city and plundering its temples of rich goods. Having established his territorial kingdom by 2350 BC, Lugal Zagesi moved his capital to the prestigious city of Uruk, establishing the third dynasty of that city. However, his new kingdom would not last for long, and soon a figure from the north of Sumer would create the first true empire in history. Our series on the history of Mesopotamian civilizations will continue so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one. Dust on the floor can become airborne. Grab it with Swiffer Sweeper. The extra thick, heavy-duty cloths trap all kinds of dust, dirt, and hair on contact. See you, dust! And Swiffer partners with the American Lung Association to support clean air. In our previous episode, we discussed the rise and fall of the first empire in history, the Akkadian Empire. Its great rulers from Sargon to Naram-Sin broke the mold and set in motion a way of running a state which would be emulated for thousands of years to come. From this point forward, the empire would be the prominent form of government. However, before another could rise in the region, a dark age had to be overcome. 
After the fall of Akkad, the Gutians had established their own dynasty and hegemony in the Euphrates River Valley, which would set the stage for what was to come. Welcome to our video on the brief Sumerian Renaissance and the eventual rise of Babylon. With the shattering of Akkadian supremacy by the mid-22nd century BC, a period of fragmentation once again occurred. A series of kings from the region of Gutium reigned for almost a century from the former Akkadian capital and had relatively symbolic authority over the southern region of Sumer. While the period was one of uncertainty for government and trade, the Sumerian south managed to gain considerable economic advantage from the limited tribute exacted by the Gutian kings in Akkad. Several great native Sumerian rulers reigned in this era, including Gudea, who ruled the powerful city of Lagash from 2144 to 2124 BC. He seems to have been a peaceful and humble ruler, using the title of Ensi rather than the more grandiose Lugal, despite his vast power, seeing himself as a representative on earth of his city god, Ningirsu, to which he dedicated many honest prayers and statues. He was also a social reformer, cancelling debt and allowing women to inherit and own family property if their husbands were to perish. The man who would end the period was Utuhigal of the 5th Uruk dynasty. He formed a coalition of Sumer and faced the great Gutian king Tirigan in battle, luring him into a trap and defeating him after arresting two of the Gutian envoys. Tirigan fled on his war chariot and attempted to escape, but was captured and executed by Utuhigal, who now established a brief period of Uruk hegemony. However, in 2112 BC, an Ensi named Ur-Namu overthrew the Uruk hegemony and established the third dynasty of Ur. Five kings of this new nascent empire ruled until 2004 BC and consolidated their rule through efficient and extensive administrative talent rather than constant expansionism. The third dynasty established the first directly controlled economy, while the traditionally independent city-states of Sumer and Akkad lost their autonomy. For the first time, Ensi were not native representatives of the larger empire, but appointed governors under the rule of the kings at Ur. This was similar to the way Ionian Greek cities were initially administered by the Persian-appointed tyrants after their conquest of Lydia, where governors were installed in Ephesus, Halicarnassus and other cities in the region. In addition, the native Sumerian gods were replaced by the deified kings of Ur. This loss of autonomy and the disruption of traditional religious practices is likely to have engendered significant anger towards the Ur kings and it is hinted in the sources that many rebellions occurred but were not documented by the ruling dynasty. Despite this, the cities of Sumer experienced great prosperity during the Third Ur dynasty, with the construction of new canals promoting new trade routes throughout the realm. Most long-lasting of all Ur's achievements was the Ur ziggurat, which survives to this day, 4,100 years later, Calculation of soil richness and other estimates for the optimal production of goods were also taken, drastically increasing economic efficiency in the centrally controlled system. All of this prosperity benefited the large cities, but also allowed other smaller centers to prosper and grow. One of these newer cities was formerly a small and obscure town, but had grown to become one of the economic provincial cores of the Third Ur Dynasty's empire, Babylon. Like all empires, the third dynasty of Ur began to decline around the end of the 21st century BC. Famine, drought and invasions by a new nomadic group, the Amorites, began to take its toll, and the empire ceased to exist in 2004 BC, when a series of conflicts with their eastern neighbours came to its conclusion, with Elam as the victor, who then destroyed Ur. Into this Mesopotamian vacuum of power came ever more Amorite tribes, now with royal ambitions. These nomadic semi-pastoralists, whose name literally means people of the west, supposedly originated in the highlands region west of the Middle Euphrates. These Amorites were the very same people whom the Israelites supposedly defeated in the biblical texts. 
their lifestyle before the migrations into the river valleys consisted of seasonal migrations from semi-arid areas in the winter and wet areas in the summer to tend their herds. Conflict between the settled civilizations in Mesopotamia and the Amorites began as early as the reign of Akkadian king Shah Kalishari, in whose reign a battle was fought with the nomads, as attested to by his twelfth year name. Significant numbers of Amorites moving into the Tigris-Euphrates region, as mentioned before, was a key factor in the decline and fall of the Third Dynasty of Ur, with their initial mass settlement in the Mesopotamian region being dated to this period. The Amorite invasions of the Near East took place in several phases. During the first, they invaded and dominated Palestine. In the second, they thrust north and invaded the Syrian region, including Ebla, Mari, Yamhad, Katna, and Ekkalatum. Finally, they invaded northern and southern Mesopotamia, taking root and establishing dynasties in Isin, Lhasa, and Babylon. Upon encountering the sophisticated and seemingly splendorous civilization which had developed in the Euphrates-Tigris region, they must have wanted to become a part of it and never left, melding so well into the local populations that after a few decades they were indistinguishable from the natives. Welcome to the Disney Bundle, where Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus come to life on all your screens. We know that this period was one of warfare between these scattered Near Eastern kingdoms, but we do not know the details of most of these realms. The most prominent known Amorite kingdom in the north was eventually centered on the ancient city of Mari. During the Third Ur Dynasty period, Mari was nominally a vassal of the Ur kings and enjoyed prosperity, but suffered a sharp decline after its fall, and Mari itself was even abandoned. Near the end of the 19th century BC, a ruler of Amorite Similite descent named Yagid Lim conquered many cities in the region of Mari on the Middle Euphrates. Carrying on the momentum, he took the old city itself as his capital in 1830 BC and established the third Mariat kingdom under the so-called Lim dynasty. His son, Yadun Lim, inherited the throne and would begin Mari's most prosperous century. He introduced the Babylonian language and writing style as the administrative standard, introduced the old Akkadian practice of year names, pursued military conquests against neighboring states and nomadic tribes, constructed irrigation systems, and constructed fortresses to consolidate territorial gains. The dynamism of this new Amorite dynasty established Mari as the dominant state on the Middle Euphrates, however overextension would soon have dire consequences. This period of fragmentation in ancient Mesopotamia was one of constant warfare, and the Mari ruler attempted to expand towards the Habur River, which brought him into conflict with the Kingdom of Upper Mesopotamia under its ruler Shamshi Adad. After suffering some defeats to their new enemy, Yadhun Lim was assassinated in a palace coup orchestrated by his son during 1795 BC, and then two years later, Mari itself was conquered. Shamshi Adad was himself one of the great rulers of the Amorite period. He also belonged to a family of Amorite tribal chiefs who had long fought against the aforementioned Yagid Lim and the state of Eshnana to the southeast. At one point, during a time of weakness for the upcoming ruler, Shamshi Adad had to flee to the rising state of Babylon due to his home city of Akalatum being threatened by neighboring domains. However, after a few years of exile, he returned to power in Akalatum and subjugated the old Assyrian region and Assur itself. He removed Assyrian king Erisham from the throne and declared himself king of Assyria, and this region was then assigned to his eldest son, Ishmidagan, with a capital at Akalatum. One of the key moments in Shamshi Adad's reign came when he managed to conquer the internally squabbling Lim dynasty of Mari where he proceeded to appoint his younger son, Yasma Adu, as co-ruler in this region. Meanwhile, Shamshi Adad himself constructed an entirely new city, named Shubat Enlil. This established an almost triarchic system of government, with his sons acting as both co-kings and practical governors of important regions. We also know about the contrasting relationship between Shamshi Adad and his two sons in relation to their position. 
he favoured his elder son, Ishmi Dugan, who was viewed as a competent and able administrator of his province, and often left him to rule his region independently. Meanwhile, the younger son, Yasmadu, was viewed as immature, incompetent, and in constant need of guidance from his father and brother. On one occasion, he constructed many statues of the gods in Mari without taking into account the recurring costs of the cattle needed for sacrifices. However, it is possible that these strains could have been exacerbated, or even caused, by Shamshi Adad's constant requests for the economic resources of Mari. From the provision of troops for his many military endeavours, to the supplying of technical and administrative specialists for his many public works projects, Mari's subordinate status drained the city consistently. Having conquered Mari, Shamshi Adad now acquired a western border with the powerful kingdom of Yamhad, with its capital at Aleppo. Worried about this potential threat, a marriage alliance was forged between the empire based at Shubat Enlil and the Ketna, which was to the south of Yamhad. In this period of his supremacy, it is speculated that one of the vassals of Shamshi Adad may have been the Amorite king of nascent Babylon, Hammurabi. Despite the brief period of prosperity which his strangely administered empire enjoyed, it was not to last. The Turaku nomads from the Zagros mountains penetrated deep into northern Mesopotamia and many regions in the empire rebelled. On top of this, Shamshi Adad's ally in the powerful kingdom of Eshnana died and was replaced by a hostile, ambitious king. Meanwhile, Yamhad began to launch attacks from the west. As his reign progressed, more authority was delegated to his sons and family, and finally, in 1776 BC, Shamshi Adad perished. The Mari segment of his empire collapsed almost immediately under the incompetent younger son, who was expelled, being replaced by a supposed claimant of the Lim dynasty, Zimri Lim. Meanwhile, Ishmi Dagan retained control only of a drastically reduced Assyrian region, consisting mainly of Assur, Akalatum, and the immediate vicinity. Over the next few decades, he would engage in a rivalry with Zimri Lim. Unfortunately for Ishmi Dagan, he was cut off from the prosperous Sumerian and Anatolian trade routes by the expansionary Lim dynasty, and this made his influence weaken even further. The continuous bouts of warfare between the rivals eventually drew in other powers from the wider region, eager to gain from the conflict, such as Lhasa, Babylon, Isin, and others. Eventually, this fragmentation of power caused a wider period of warfare to erupt in the region, when the Eshnana kingdom began to rapidly expand to the north and west. It was opposed by Zimri Lim of Mari, Yamhad, and Babylon, and over the subsequent years, its progress was rolled back and the annexed cities were abandoned. While its peripheral gains had been erased, Eshnana was still too powerful to attack directly. At this point, a new phase of the conflict began when Elam struck Eshnana from the east, tipping the balance of power. They besieged the capital city, initially supported by Mari and Babylon. However, when the Elamites threatened to expand their power into these regions as well, they turned against Elam and managed to defeat them. This victory ended the period of region-wide warfare, but would also set the stage for the next hegemon to ascend to prominence, Hammurabi of Babylon. Our series on the history of the Mesopotamian civilizations will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one. You are 100% pregnant. The Nordic Track Freestride Trainer is an elliptical, a stepper, and a low-impact running machine that transports your workout.
to the most beautiful places on the planet. Nordic Track, the home of interactive personal training. In our previous video, we discussed the rise of the Third Dynasty of Ur and its collapse at the hands of Amorite invaders from the west. The subsequent period of political fragmentation was one of regional conflict, with the Amorite Shamshi Adad and his dynasty ruling in the north, while the Eshnana dominated central Mesopotamia and Larsa reigned over the south. Many names from this period are a mystery to the general public but that of Babylon is a notable exception. Under one of its most famous kings, Hammurabi, this new entity would rise to unify the entire region in a new empire, eclipsing the previous civilizations to the point where Sumer and Akkad were simply known as Babylonia. Welcome to our video on the rise of Babylon. Thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. What is Raid Shadow Legends? Epic dark fantasy done right. Hundreds of champions to collect, zero cartoons. Raid Shadow Legends is a brand new collection RPG game that is taking the mobile gaming landscape by storm. More than 10 million players worldwide have already downloaded the game in less than six months. Enjoy a fully voiced story campaign and 13 spectacular locations. And the best part, it is free to play. Check out the amazing graphics and details on those champions. And in Raid, you have the ability to personally customize, choose artifacts, and design a unique mastery build for each one of them. What we love about the game are the infinite customization options. Raid has 300,000 positive reviews that agree with us. Raid has an almost perfect score on the Play Store. The game is growing super fast, and the highly anticipated new Faction Wars feature is now live. And there is a new awesome rewards program for new players. Get a new daily login reward for the first 90 days in the game. Go to the video description, click on these special links and you'll get 50,000 silver and a free epic champion as part of the new player program to start your journey. The settlement that would become Babylon, known as Babar at the time, was possibly inhabited as a minor and unimportant town as soon as the early dynastic period, from 2900 to 2350 BC. Its ruler styled himself as the builder of a temple dedicated to the god Marduk, the patron of the future illustrious city. The first definite mention of Babylon in historical sources occurs during the reign of Akkadian king Shah Kalishari, during which he laid the foundations of a temple in the city. Later, during the Third Dynasty of Ur, King Shogi reorganized the lands of Sumer and Akkad into 20 provinces, each governed by a local ensi. This and the wider bureaucratic control exerted by the Third Ur Dynasty kings led to profound long-term changes in the region, which would eventually result in it becoming the capital of one of the core provinces in the Neo-Sumerian Empire. It was also governed by an ensi, which could have been hereditary in certain situations. Ita Elam, his son Issa Elam, and Abba were all part of the same family, which indicates the presence of native local rulers in Babylon. In the late 21st century BC, increasing numbers of Amorite pastoralists began to migrate east and make their homes in the settled civilizations of Mesopotamia. This wave of migration played a key role in the fall of Ur, and in the political fragmentation that followed, an Amorite chief known as Sumu Abum usurped the kingship and established the first Babylonian dynasty in 1894 BC. His successor, Sumu Lael, took power in 1880 BC and expanded his kingdom even further to cover an area from Sippar in the north to Marad in the south, encompassing many prominent old cities such as Kish, whose walls he demolished in order to consolidate Babylonian hegemony. During his reign, the first indisputable evidence for the cult of Marduk was also documented, when during 1860 BC, a throne of gold and silver was fashioned for the Babylonian sky god in the city. Three future kings, Sabium, 
Apil Sin and Sin Mubalit reigned over the subsequent half century of relative stability. Before we discuss Hammurabi himself, we must first speak of the broader political situation in Sumer and Akkad into which he would emerge. We covered the exploits of the northern Amorite kingdoms in our previous video, however the Sumerian south was also a battleground. As the Third Ur dynasty weakened, an official named Ishbi Era, who served the final Ur king Ibi Sin, betrayed his master and established his own power base at Isin. After the Elamites sacked Ur in 2002 BC, it was he who recaptured it and expelled the foreign Elamites from the region. For this, his opportunistically created Isin dynasty earned the official endorsement of the Nippur priesthood as the third Ur dynasty's heirs. For upwards of half a century, this clan possessed hegemony over Sumer and Akkad, However, its fortunes would begin to change with the emergence of yet another Amorite leader named Gunganum, who reigned from 1932 to 1906 BC. He seems to have been the governor of Larsa, city of the Mesopotamian sun god Utu, during Isin rule. This governor revolted against his native rulers and eventually captured the former royal capital of Ur, gaining himself a massive ideological and financial victory. Therefore, by the middle of the 19th century BC, it was Babylon and Larsa which constituted the rising powers in Sumer and Akkad. Welcome to the Carvana Focus Group. My name's Christina. I work in the research department. Now that you've had a few minutes to play around with the app, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, hi, Dave Samuels here. You're telling me I can buy a car entirely online? You got it. And then you'll deliver it to me. Or I can pick it up at a car vending machine? That's correct. And if I don't like it, I can simply return it for another one? That's exactly right. I don't get it. That's all right. That's what this focus group is for. Any other questions before we begin? Oh, hi, uh, Becky Davidson. Just so you're aware, you don't need to all keep saying your names. You have named everyone. Uh, hi, Becky Davidson. I was wondering, what if I have a small budget? No problem. Carvana lets you customize your down payment and monthly payment on your dream car. What if I have too much money? <laughs> Same answer. In fact, they had already clashed in a series of small engagements with the Babylonian kings using diplomatic marriages with the tribally related 6th Uruk dynasty as a buffer against the powerful Lhasa in the south. After a short period of internal strife, a dynasty of Amorites from east of the Tigris under Kudur Mabuk took Lhasa and deposed Gunganum's descendant in 1834 BC. Rather than ruling the realm himself, he would take a ceremonial position as father of the Amorite country and appointed his eldest son, Warad Sin, to rule in his name, in a similar manner to Shamshi Adad's earlier Trimorphic Empire. In 1822 BC, Rim Sin succeeded his older brother and would begin a crusade to expand his own kingdom. This lesser known ruler became so powerful that he defeated a coalition of Uruk, Isin, Sutium, Rapicum, and Babylon under Hammurabi's father in 1810 BC. Eight years later, in 1802 BC, he captured Uruk and ended the dynasty ruled by Babylon's allies. By the end of the 19th century BC, control of the prosperous city of Ur and the Persian Gulf trade routes granted Lhasa a sudden period of prosperity, which can be seen in the remnants of large private houses in the city throughout this period. Finally, in 1794 BC, Rimsin extinguished the remnants of the Isin dynasty and annexed their territory, an event which was so important to the kings of Lhasa that every year after it was named in its honour. By the time Hammurabi's father, Sin Mubalit, perished in 1793, Lhasa controlled all of Sumer and wielded significant power. The next year, 1792 BC, saw Hammurabi finally ascend to the throne of Babylon at the age of 18. He inherited a rising state. 
his ancestors had gradually conquered cities such as Borsippa, Kish, and Sippar. Despite this, Babylon was still far from the most important of the many realms in the region when Hammurabi took power. The expansionist Eshnunna occupied Babylon's northeastern border, the aforementioned powerful state of Lhasa under Rim-Sin was to their south, and the foreign nation of Elam was to the east. At the same time, the main power in the region was the Upper Mesopotamian Kingdom under Shamshi Adad, which often cooperated with the new, apparently subservient Babylonian king. The monarchs often performed small favours for one another, such as sheltering persecuted diplomats or extraditing criminals who escaped to the other's territory. While this alliance of sorts had its benefits, the presence of Shamshi Adad to the north hemmed Hammurabi in and prevented any kind of Babylonian expansion for many years. Instead, the king focused on being a magnanimous and generous monarch in the mould of Gudea from centuries earlier, pleasing the god Inanna, otherwise known as Ishtar in Akkadian, by commissioning a throne of gold, silver, precious stones and lapis lazuli was a noted achievement, as well as establishing justice in the land, that is, cancelling all debts which citizens would often accumulate. This establishment of justice had the secondary effect of rendering the debtors loyal to him rather than their wealthy creditors. For 28 years, Hammurabi focused on the internal development of his city, reorganizing many aspects of the economy and carrying out the aforementioned kingly tasks. However, a conflict would soon be ignited, which would eventually propel Babylon to never-before-seen heights in Mesopotamia. By this time, Shamshi Adad's empire had fallen, and Zimri Lim of Mari had usurped his incompetent younger son, Yasma Adad, from his co-royal capital. In early 1767, the supreme king of Elam, the Sokol Ma Siwe Pala Hupak, made an alliance with Zimri Lim. Their common ground centered around the expansionist state of Eshnana. It blocked Elamite expansion into Mesopotamia, and also meddled in the affairs of Mari's sphere of influence, so they allied against it, sealing their alliance with an exchange of gold, silver and wine from Mari, and tin from Elam which was a key resource in the production of bronze. In late 1766 BC, the alliance attacked Eshnunna, and while the details are vague, it is clear that the king of the city disappeared and the local king of Susa, the Sukal, instead took up occasional residence in the city. From there he would impose direct rule upon the cities of Mesopotamia under the Elamites, a practice which they had not taken part in before instead preferring to raid and loot the wealthy Euphrates Tigris Basin. The Elamite occupiers now schemed further, embarking on a dangerous diplomatic gamble. They contacted both Hammurabi of Babylon and Rimsin of Lhasa, commanding both rulers to provide troops with which to attack the other. Unfortunately for the foreign Elamites, the two rulers apparently compared notes, perhaps motivated by their common Mesopotamian culture, and realized the attempted foreign duplicity, resulting in both of these realms exchanging diplomats and joining forces. I photographed food in New York and Philadelphia and Paris. DocuSign makes it easier for me to do business. When I think of work, I think of being invested in telling a story. Being a small business owner means I'm the CEO, accounting department, the CFO, the head of sales. No one gets into photography because they like contracts. DocuSign lets me take care of the business side much faster. I can get release forms, master service agreements, all sorts of contracts taken care of wherever I am, whenever I want. It's easy to prepare agreements, get them signed, and even get paid. It's foolproof. There's no missing information when I get the signed agreement back. It streamlines business processes that used to take a long time in the past. It's also easier for my clients. DocuSign guides them through the agreements. With DocuSign, on my phone or my laptop, I can do it on the run between shoots. It's great. The world's changing every day. So are my clients and their expectations. So no matter what's going on around me, DocuSign helps me capture that moment. It's fast, painless, reliable, and secure. Hi there, welcome to Forward. Come on in. I'm Dr. Nate Pavini. 
In early 1765 BC, events occurred on two fronts, both north and south. In the north, the Elamites sent several proxy armies, with troops from Elam, Eshnunna, and mercenaries from the Zagros Mountains, to assault northern Mesopotamia, commanded by client kings of Elam in the north. This maneuver led to a few years of back-and-forth conflict, during which the Sukulma ruined his previously established alliance with Mari. Meanwhile to the south, Hammurabi reacted decisively to a threat from the king of Susa, who coveted Babylon itself and intended to seize it. Calling upon the many cities and kingdoms of the region, Hammurabi managed to head a grand alliance of Mesopotamia, including Yamhad, Akalatum, and most of the Akkadian city-states. Most prominent was Zimri Lin of Mari, who sealed a pact with the Babylonians in the middle of 1765 BC, which included the words, From this day on, for as long as I live, I will be at war with Siwe Pala Hupak. The Mari king's subsequent active levying of both urban and nomadic troops for Hammurabi can be understood due to Elamite intervention in northern Mesopotamia. It is likely he saw Babylon as a dagger with which to stab the foreign invaders. In gratitude for this generous assistance, Hammurabi granted monetary rewards to the soldiers even before they fought and invited all of them to feast in his presence in order to make them feel welcome in the foreign land. Notably absent from the anti-Elam alliance was Larsa, who remained neutral. The first move was made by Sukul Kudu Zalush, king of Susa, who advanced into Babylonian lands and put the city of Upi under siege. This assault pushed Hammurabi to conscript even the merchants into the military, who were usually exempt due to their valued profession. He also sent repeated envoys to Rim Sin of Lhasa asking for help, but was met with stony silence as the only response. Initially, the Babylonian garrison in the city resisted the foreign invaders, but eventually they boarded ships and fled after waiting so long that they realized the city would not be relieved. After capturing Upi, the Elamites did not advance further west and instead withdrew to Eshnana. At the start of the campaigning season in 1764 BC, the Elamites returned, crossing the Tigris at Mankisum and besieging the city of Hiratum with 30,000 men, assault ramps and other siege engines. However, this attempt was undermined by the inhabitants of the city, who opened the irrigation canals around the city, washing the siege weaponry away. At the same time, an allied army under a Mari general attacked the invading army from behind and relieved Hiratum. As these defensive actions were conducted, allied offensives were also underway. Hammurabi sent multiple raiding forces to outflank and pillage the countryside of Eshnunna, setting fire to their fields and stealing cattle. These defeats, constant Babylonian pressure, possibly disloyal allied Eshnunna officers, and internal dissent all caused the Elamites to retreat to their own lands. Hammurabi had used his diplomatic prowess to rally an alliance to his side and repel a dangerous enemy, and now he had a free hand to pursue further plans in the region. During the war against Elam, Rim Sin had remained neutral, ignoring Hammurabi's repeated requests for assistance despite their alliance. This irritated the Babylonian, who now wanted revenge against his main competitor. Finally, in 1763 BC, Hammurabi declared war on Rim Sin, justifying it as a preemptive act authorized by the gods. He still had Mari's crucial support and besieged and captured Mashkan Shapir relatively quickly, followed by Nippur and Isin during the middle of 1763 BC, after which he advanced on Lhasa. After a six-month siege, the inhabitants of Lhasa ran out of food and Hammurabi tore down the city walls, but did not raise the city. Rim Sin initially escaped, but was soon captured and killed. The Babylonian king then cancelled debts in the newly captured city, as he had in his capital. The fundamental political makeup of Sumer and Akkad had now changed forever. City-states were no longer the standard unit of the region, replaced by Babylonia, 
which would continuously form into a large territorial state from this point forward. However, Hammurabi's empire still had not reached its zenith, and its achievements, which we shall discuss in our next video, secured its place in history. Our series on the history of the Mesopotamian civilizations will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. Today we're talking about making better decisions, which is a really big deal, because your decisions determine the direction and quality of your life. Your decisions have shaped the direction and quality of your life for good or maybe not so good. So it's a good thing we're talking about it right here. Need long-lasting freshness? Try new Febreze Unstoppable Touch Fabric Spray. It doesn't just eliminate odor. Simply shake and spray to unlock the breakthrough power of touch-activated scent technology that lasts even hours later. That's because Febreze Touch stores scent in your fabric, so you get bursts of freshness with every touch. Your whole world will come alive. Welcome home to fresh with new Febreze Touch. The Gauls were one of Rome's oldest and most bitter enemies. They had sacked Rome and throughout the centuries fought alongside the Republic's most dangerous adversaries, including Pyrrhus and Hannibal. By the end of the 2nd century BC, southern Gaul was largely subdued, however there was still tension in northern Gaul, particularly along the Rhine. These tensions would ultimately climax in the Gallic Wars the conflict that would shape the future of Western Europe for centuries to come, giving rise to the Holy Roman Empire and modern-day France, the conflict that would forever etch the name Gaius Julius Caesar in the annals of history. Rome had been rocked by almost half a century of civil wars, and the Republic was in decline. Both Marius and Sulla had marched on Rome, highlighting the ineffectiveness of the system for maintaining a large empire, and the fact that the legionaries were more loyal to their generals than to the state. Following this chaotic period, three men had established an unofficial alliance to effectively control the Republic. This was the first triumvirate, consisting of the famous general Pompey the Great, the richest man in Rome, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. Caesar had been consul the year before in 59 BC, but his political campaigning had left him in debt and made him many enemies in Rome. He needed to make money fast and gain enough military success to keep his political adversaries at bay. When the time came for distributing provinces for Caesar to govern as proconsul, he was able to use his political allies to secure Cisalpine Gaul, Illyricum, and Transalpine Gaul for an unprecedented five years. This put Caesar in control of four veteran legions, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, all of whom had fought with Caesar before in Hispania and were loyal to him. They had a total of roughly 22,000 legionaries plus auxiliaries. Caesar now had the men he needed. All he needed was an excuse for war. Fortunately for Caesar, a Celtic tribe, the Helvetii, was planning a migration into Gaul in 58 BC. Their leader, Oregtorix, had formed a confederation with a number of neighbouring tribes, the Tolingi, Latubrigi, Rauraki and Boii, and now they numbered 368,000 men, women and children. Oregtorix had even convinced them all to burn their homes in order to leave no option of failure. However, soon he was accused of being a tyrant and was forced to commit suicide. Command passed to Divico. Divico was determined to stick to the plan and began amassing supplies in order to start pouring into Gaul. 
To do this, they would either have to pass through the land of the Roman ally Edui and the province of Transalpine Gaul, or take the longer route through the mountain passes in the north. The Romans had built up a healthy fear of migrating tribes following the Cimbrian War in 113-101 BC, and so Caesar, hearing of this, was only too willing to come to the rescue of the Edui. He took the only available legion in the area and force-marched them up to Geneva, destroying the bridge on the Rhone that provided access into Transalpine Gaul. The Helvetii appealed to Caesar, asking for military access through Roman lands and promising they would not attack. Caesar played for time, pretending to consider this offer for almost 15 days. Using this time, his legion was able to construct a fortified embankment almost 5 meters high, stretching 20 miles along the riverbank. With the legion manning the embankment and now in a stronger position, Caesar denied the Helvetii access and refused to allow them to cross. Some of the Helvetii ignored this and attempted to cross nonetheless in small boats, but were prevented from doing so by the legionaries throwing javelins and shooting arrows into them. With the southern route thus blocked, the Helvetii decided to take the longer northern route through the mountains into Gaul. Leaving his top lieutenant, Labienus, in command, Caesar returned to Italy to levy a further two legions and to pull the other three veteran legions out of their winter quarters in Aquileia, bringing his total to approximately 33,000 legionaries plus auxiliaries. Despite Labienus being in a strong position to easily block the mountain pass, the Helvetii managed to push into Gallic territories and began ravaging the land. The Gauls pleaded with Caesar to intervene and chase the Helvetii out, and Caesar, yet again, was only too willing to help, marching his legions into the Gallic territories. The decision of Labienus to not hold the Helvetii in the mountains was likely an order received from Caesar. The Celts were now in open terrain, which better suited the Roman legions, and their pillaging of Gaul gave Caesar an excuse to intervene. Word reached Caesar that the Helvetii were currently attempting a crossing at the Ara River. They had been crossing in four large groups, using many rafts and boats, but due to the size of the horde and their lack of organization, the crossing had already taken them days, and one group was still yet to cross. Caesar took his legions and swiftly marched to the river. Quickly forming his legions into battle formation, Caesar fell upon the Celts waiting to cross. Caught unaware, unprepared and encumbered by their baggage, the Helvetii did not even have enough time to form a proper battle line. The fighting was over quickly, with the whole stranded group being killed or fleeing into the nearby woods, whilst the other three groups could do nothing but watch helplessly from the other side of the river. The main Helvetii force began to move on, and, not wanting to lose the initiative, Caesar quickly built a bridge across the river and moved all of his six legions across. The crossing that had taken the Celts 20 days had taken the Romans just one. Caesar began tailing the Helvetii, waiting for the right time to strike. There were a few minor cavalry skirmishes, but nothing decisive. Caesar did once manage to find a battlefield that was advantageous, and even had Labienus in position behind the enemy. However, due to poor communication from his scouts, Caesar was forced to pull back from the battlefield. This caused a delay in Caesar's plan, and he was beginning to run low on rations. He decided to head for the nearby town of Vibracta to resupply his army before continuing the pursuit. As he began to march off, however, Divico gave chase, harassing the rear of the Roman army. Caesar sent his cavalry and light infantry to fight a delaying action in order to buy time to deploy his main force on a nearby hill. The four veteran legions formed three lines at the front, with the two newly levied legions along with the auxiliaries positioned further up the hill. These men were not tested in battle, and so were not expected to do any of the fighting 
instead they were to guard the baggage and were spread thin across the hill to seemingly increase the size of Caesar's army. The Helvetii, numbering somewhere between 60 to 90,000 warriors, had successfully fought off the Roman cavalry and light infantry, forcing them to retreat. Now they had formed their infantry into a tightly packed shield wall and advanced on the Romans. The front two lines of legionaries opened the battle with a volley of javelins. These hampered the Helvetii by becoming stuck in their shields, forcing them to drop them and break into a looser formation. With the shield wall in disarray, the Roman front lines charged into melee. The fighting was intense and tough, but the Romans' discipline and experience gave them the edge. Slowly they began to get the upper hand, with the Helvetii being forced back to a nearby mountain. However, as the Romans pressed up the mountain, a portion of the Helvetii allies, composed of Boii and Telingi, roughly 15,000 warriors, entered the battle. These men had been acting as a rearguard, protecting the camp, and now they fell on the Roman flank, threatening to encircle them. The Helvetii, bolstered by the arrival of their allies, began pushing back with renewed vigour. With the two front lines of legionaries already engaging the Helvetii on the mountain, Caesar committed his final line of veterans, which had been acting as a reserve. After hours of hard fighting, the Helvetii on the mountain were eventually broken and forced from the battle. However, the Boii and Telingi fell back to the camp to make a last stand. Using their baggage wagons, they formed a makeshift rampart and continued the fight, hurling missiles down into the Roman ranks. This is where the fighting was the most difficult, as the Boii were famed warriors and fought desperately. Finally, after fighting long into the night, the third line was able to break into the camp, ending the battle. The battle had lasted almost 12 hours. Caesar had lost perhaps 5,000 men, whilst the Helvetii had lost around 40 to 60,000. Of the 368,000 people who began the migration, only 130,000 were now left. Caesar, with no cavalry to speak of, was not able to give chase immediately, and gave his men three days in order to recover from the battle before starting the pursuit. The Helvetii, seeing the Romans chasing them once more, surrendered completely and were forced to return to their homeland and made a vassal of Rome, acting as a buffer between Roman and Germanic lands. Caesar had achieved his aim of gaining a I'm Agent Mobius, by the way. The Salem Witch Trial Fear and superstition have been guiding forces for mankind for thousands of years. Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. Um, you've noticed what we've noticed, right? In the last few days, it seems as though someone somewhere hit a button. All of a sudden, we are seeing conservatives, Republicans coming out to finally state the obvious. COVID vaccines are saving lives, they are safe and effective, and they are a great way of protecting you, your family, and your loved ones from the scourge of COVID, an infectious respiratory virus which has already killed more than 600,000 Americans, and at various points brought our hospitals and our broader society to its knees. 
please take COVID seriously. I can't say it enough. Enough people have died. We don't need any more deaths. America, we're in this together. And if you can, get the vaccine. For information on vaccine sites, visit the vaccine finder on the homepage of foxnews.com. You do see uh, about 95 to 98 percent of people in the hospital for COVID are people that aren't vaccinated. And, and I just, you know, I wanted, I was ready to get the vaccine. I've always felt it was safe and effective. These shots need to get in everybody's arm as rapidly as possible, or we're going to be back in a situation in the fall that we don't yearn for that we went through last year. If you are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, the chance of you getting seriously ill or dying from COVID is effectively zero. All of this is great and very welcome, but it is striking to see. I mean, striking to see someone like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis getting up and saying, hey, guys, the vaccines will save your lives. It is bizarre because seeing it makes you realize just how completely absent Republicans have been for all this time. We, of course, have covered the anti-vax or anti-pro-vax, just asking questions, uh, juvenile trolling from Fox News, and the irresponsible, wildly insidious way they have covered the pandemic. But it is strange how much mainstream Republicans, the big mouthpiece for conservatism, have been essentially absent on the whole question altogether. I think that is because, from the beginning, huge parts of the Republican Party have seen the pandemic as fundamentally a political problem rather than a once-in-a-lifetime health crisis. Now, the person that set the tone for that was, of course, Donald Trump, and it flowed down. Because the most important thing to Donald Trump, who was the leader of the Republican Party and was president when the pandemic hit, was what the pandemic was doing to the stock market and therefore his reelection campaign. On Monday, March 9th, 2020, with the stock market expected to fall precipitously, remember, rather than do something that would actually improve the situation, Trump tried to bluff his way through, tweeting, quote, the fake news media and their partner, the Democrat Party, is doing everything within its semi-considerable power, used to be greater, to inflame the coronavirus situation far beyond what the facts would warrant. Surgeon General, the risk is low to the average American. The Dow fell 8% that day. Three days later, on Thursday, it fell 10% for what was the worst day since the 1987 crash. And so on Friday, to rally the market, Trump paraded a bunch of CEOs around the Rose Garden in the afternoon, made a bunch of empty promises that Google has 1,700 engineers working on a website to facilitate COVID testing. They did not have 1,700 engineers working on that. And then when the Dow finished higher that day, after a terrible week, Trump signed the stock chart and gave it to his loyal supporter, Lou Dobbs of Fox Business. That did nothing to stop COVID from spreading, right? Trump never actually cared about stopping COVID from spreading, about stopping people from getting sick. Just the week before that, he had openly admitted he did not want to let Americans infected with COVID off a cruise ship because, quote, I'd rather have them stay on. I don't need the numbers to double. Now, Trump is a special case, okay? He is a sociopath who I believe actually lacks the ability to actually appreciate human suffering and loss at a very deep level. Just actually can't do it. And because he treated the disease like a public relations issue, that did set the tone for the rest of the party. It wasn't just Trump. Here's a great example. Texas Senator Ted Cruz echoing the exact same cynicism exactly one year ago today. Three days only. Save big on Ring Alarm security kits. Go worry-free with whole home security that... If it ends up that Biden wins in November, I hope he doesn't. I don't think he will, but if he does... I guarantee you the week after the election, suddenly all those Democratic governors, all those Democratic mayors will say, everything's magically better. Go back to work, go back to school. Suddenly the problems are solved. You won't even have to wait for Biden to be sworn in. All they'll need is election day. And suddenly their willingness to just destroy people's lives and livelihoods, they will have accomplished their task. That's wrong. It's cynical. And, 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 and we shouldn't be a part of it. Okay. Utterly, completely, in every possible conceivable way wrong. Just just astoundingly, beautifully wrong, right? <laughs> it was Republicans that rushed to open up sooner, even after Biden was elected. Democratic states, even the schools, right? More reticent. Just completely wrong. Ted Cruz, absolutely wrong. It's not how things shook out. But it's so revealing. 
Why did he make that mistake? Because Ted Cruz himself only views the pandemic through a political prism. And so he projects it onto everyone else. He thinks Democrats do too. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis consistently downplayed the health threats throughout this crisis, and he was uh, applauded uh, by Republicans for winning uh, the, the pandemic. Just last week, he started selling a bunch of anti-COVID uh, expertise merchandise, including lockdown koozies with a quote by him saying, how the hell am I going to be able to drink a beer with a mask on? And t-shirts that read, don't Fauci my Florida. That's all about political positioning. It was always about political positioning. And to be fair, there's been a lot of political posturing around the pandemic from Democrats and liberals as well. There has been. But the deep problem here is that there's always been this sense among Republicans and Republican politicians, not all of them, but the vast majority, that COVID is essentially an invented threat. The libs are more or less making this up. You just need to you know, manage it and, and move along and not freak out. Now, I do think there's a complex relationship between who's leading the pushback to, say, COVID measures, particularly vaccines, and who's following. But because of most of that, you know, if you gave most Republican politicians truth serum, I think they would tell you that once the vaccines were available, the goal for Republicans was essentially to have their cake and eat it too. Meaning, let the Biden administration, which I think Republicans secretly know is certainly far more competent than the Trump administration, generally wants to solve the problem, let the Biden administration handle the crisis. Let them administer the vaccine across the country, but don't lift a finger to aid them. Take your pot shots where you can, maybe also flirt with anti-pro-vax rhetoric like Tucker Carlson. And that way, you can have your cake and eat it too, right? You get your state vaccinated, you open up businesses, not you know, submerge your hospitals, while also wiping your hands of the whole thing and maintaining a good standing with the base that is radicalized against public health measures in general. Okay, now we saw this. States from Tennessee to Missouri to even Florida, Ron DeSantis issued an executive order about COVID mandates, right? Now, the perfect example of the inherent contradictions of this are the Republicans who refuse to say if they are vaccinated. Tucker Carlson, for example, is using the same line to multiple reporters, um, comparing sharing his vaccination status to sharing his favorite sex positions. He's used that line uh, multiple times. It's the kind of line that like, would maybe be clever from a 12-year-old. Um, he's very proud of it. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene claimed that asking her status uh, at a press conference the other day is a HIPAA violation. It's not. Uh, <laughs> and wouldn't you expect her to be the first person to just tell you she's not vaccinated and be proud about it? But for some reason, she didn't want to answer. Neither did Tucker Carlson. I wonder what their vaccination status is. Today, Congressman Ronnie Jackson asked why Democrats don't get asked if they have been vaccinated. And the answer is because they have been and they told everyone because they want other people to get vaccinated. In fact, a bunch of reporters called up every member of Congress and every Democratic member of Congress said, yeah, I got vaccinated, you should too, because they want people to not get killed from COVID. And I think what's happened here, as I try to make sense of what we're seeing the last few days, I do think that with all the propaganda and all the political posturing, a lot of Republicans convince themselves it really is not that big a deal, that they could just get away with a hands-off approach. But guess what? We keep relearning the same lesson over and over again, don't we, folks? It doesn't go anywhere. It's the same thing. It's out there. We may be done with COVID. COVID's not done with us. We've got a variant that is 60% more transmissible than the original virus, huge pools of unvaccinated people, and nearly all restrictions that were helping to keep the virus in check, right, on venues and businesses and social events, nightclubs, concerts, are gone. So what do you think all three of those things add up to? Well, you get an outbreak precisely like Dr. Peter Hotez said would happen. Remember, at this time last year, we were looking pretty good, and then we had that enormous acceleration after the July 4th holiday, July, August. September was terrible in this part of the country, and we have to assume that Mother Nature is telling us that that same thing's going to happen again. So I'm really holding my breath uh, and about the South is what happens over this summer. Now, Dr. Hotez is not a politician. Uh, just because he's an expert doesn't mean he's infallible, certainly, but he doesn't have a dog in the fight from a political standpoint. I mean, that, that's his best assessment.
And here's Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on Fox News with Laura Ingram laughing at him, talking about how liberals are just addicted to scaremongering. And here's where Florida cases are now. This is what the graph looks like. Look at that spike at the end. So thank you, Governor DeSantis, for telling people to get vaccinated. But we really could have used this much sooner. I'm glad you're doing it. Let's keep it up. Maybe instead of selling T-shirts and koozies, we can talk about how the vaccine has saved people's lives. And this is not about people with a certain political persuasion getting the virus or, or, or dying of it. I don't care. No one cares, really, I think. It, it's really not about politics. Everything is about politics at some level, but this shouldn't be, or it shouldn't be about politics in the way it has become. I hope this is a final moment to change that model of thinking among everyone alike, that this is fundamentally a political problem to solve, particularly the Republican Party that views it that way. Let's get everyone vaccinated. Let's save as many lives as possible. And then we could just fight about all the other stuff later, okay? When we say we speak deep, why does that matter to you? Because in Colorado, there's different lifestyles and different needs, and Jeep has a vehicle to meet all of those. And it doesn't just stop there. We speak Jeep means we have a factory trained parts and service set to keep your vehicle on. Here's the story of COVID in America. It was terrible for a long time. Then it was getting better for a while. With vaccination, curbing the virus in many, many parts of the nation. And now the story is, it's getting worse. Daily cases tripling to 41,000 now. And there are many factors at play, but experts and the Biden administration are sounding the alarm about how media misinformation from Facebook to Fox News is part of what's driving this. The U.S. Surgeon General going as far to blame misinformation for contributing to the death rate, to the lives lost, others hitting Fox News even harder. Experts arguing that politicizing vaccines and discouraging their use undermines this key safety method that we have at the very time when the nation is in a position to put COVID on its back for good. Now, amidst this pressure and this ongoing debate, some at Fox News are changing gears. They have a new formal PSA on vaccines that aired last night. Sean Hannity now backing vaccines. But it's not a uniform approach over there. Because even amidst that edit, the Fox News anchor with the largest audience, Tucker Carlson, continues to play very dangerous games. He has seized on COVID as what looks like to him another culture war ploy. He claims that people should call Child Protective Services on any parents whose children wear masks. And now he's trying to project current media criticism of Fox, some of what I just told you about, back onto others. And he's implying that accurate information about public health advice is somehow the news taking a forbidden ideological position. This is just from his latest broadcast. As a channel, CNN shouldn't have a position on whether you should take medicine or not because it's a news channel, it's not a health agency. Why is a news channel doing this? Any news channel, a lot of them are. That might sound like a real argument if you're not listening closely and we get it. People sometimes have the TV on while they're doing other things, making dinner. But this matters, and what Tucker's saying there is actually completely vapid. Seatbelts save lives. If studies show that, news channels report it. If safety experts and doctors strongly urge people to use seatbelts, the news reports that. And if government guidelines or even laws require seatbelts, you ever heard about those laws? Well, the news reports that too. It's pretty simple. And it's not taking some grand position. Indeed, on this very program, you've heard me repeat that people do have a right to decide their own health care. Last night, I asked Dr. Fauci if blanket vaccine mandates for work or school might be an overreach because we're discussing policy, not telling you how to live. But on the facts, we can also tell you seatbelts save lives. So do these vaccines. And Tucker Carlson's not consistent either. He's also joined the chorus 
of attacks on facts and experts and doctors. And what about the efficacy of the vaccine itself among adults? Why does it matter how many COVID cases we have in this country? There are a lot of those people giving you medical advice on television, and you should ignore them. Obviously, we're not doctors. So there's whiplash between Hannity embracing vaccines and other hosts carrying on. This matters. It impacts the views of millions. President Biden even discussing that changeover at Fox in new remarks. One of those other networks is not a big fan of mine. Uh, <laughs> one you talk about a lot. But if you notice, as they say in, in, in the southern part of my state, they've had an altered call, some of those guys. All of a sudden, they're out there saying, let's get vaccinated. Let's get vaccinated. The very people before this were saying, so that, but that, I, I shouldn't make fun of it. That's good. It's good. It's good. That's good. That's good. That's what it sounds like when a president's not settling a score or taking cheap shots at media critics, but rather a president thinking about how what happens on Fox impacts the lives of his constituents, of all Americans. You could call it presidenting. And while misleading and controversial statements do get more attention on TV and online, there are others in conservative media, and I want to mention this as part of our report tonight, who are speaking out on vaccines. You should know what they're saying, too. Take one of the most influential conservatives in America, a guy named Chris Ruddy. He runs Newsmax, the Trump-friendly outlet that's to the right of Fox. You may remember his name as well from the Mueller probe as a high-level Trump confidant. He has a brand new piece, and here's the title. Biden's good job on the vaccine, where he tells fellow Trump fans, I myself have gotten the Pfizer vaccine, and notes that vaccines save countless lives, and more could be saved if it were available earlier. In fact, given how reflexively skeptical conservative audience have been encouraged to be by Ruddy's friend Trump, among others, the Newsmax leader goes on to make sure people understand that he has not, he says, heard from the Biden White House about this coverage, and instead he just wants to credit Biden for the fact that he's doing a good job on this front. As for the impact on real people, well, some journalists are cataloging the price here. Part of Tucker Carlson's crusade and his rhetorical word games is to try to scare people into feeling like there's some sort of sinister government project to push these vaccines. There must be something wrong if they're being pushed hard. So he warned his viewers, the entire agenda is, quote, designed to make you comply. That's the framing. And for him, that might be an exciting way to try to vacuum up some level of interest there is out there in that. This is real. These are real lies. This is not a drill. And we're so far into this, so deep into this. It is unfortunate that I have to say that and remind people of that for those who need the reminding. But this is about real people. Here is CBS's Scott Rowe talking to a COVID patient in Louisiana about this individual's rationale for avoiding the vaccine. Let's get to the point. Your IT environment? It's complicated. Your technologies and automation tools, they don't work together. And you, you're tired of writing complex scripts to automate your processes. They're too expensive. Here I am recovering, getting out of here finally tomorrow. Am I going to get a vaccine? No. Um, Why not? Because there's too many issues with these vaccines. Before you got sick, if you would have had a chance to get the vaccine and prevent this, would you have taken the vaccine? Nope. So you would have gone through this? I'd have gone through this, yes, sir. Don't shove it down my throat. That's what's local, state, federal administration is trying to do, to shove it down your throat. What are they shoving, the science? No, they're shoving the fact that that's their agenda. The well, agenda is to get you vaccinated. The agenda is to get you vaccinated. So a choice about science or personal health has been morphed rhetorically, largely, I think, through the media, into some kind of test for resisting some political phantom government agenda you've been warned about, which is a ways away from whether the vaccine will protect you and your family, like a seatbelt, which is still, of course, your right to decide. Now, things were getting better, but where are they headed amidst all this, and what is the role of Fox and other media? 
Here's the story of COVID in America. It was terrible for a long time. Then it was getting better for a while with vaccination, curbing the virus in many, many parts of the nation. And now the story is, it's getting worse. Daily cases tripling to 41,000 now. And there are many factors at play, but experts and the Biden administration are sounding the alarm about how media misinformation from Facebook to Fox News is part of what's driving this. The U.S. Surgeon General going as far to blame misinformation for contributing to the death rate, for the lives lost, others hitting Fox News even harder. Experts arguing that politicizing vaccines and discouraging their use undermines this key safety method that we have at the very time when the nation is in a position to put COVID on its back for good. Now, amidst this pressure and this ongoing debate, some at Fox News are changing gears. They have a new formal PSA on vaccines that aired last night. Sean Hannity now backing vaccines. But it's not a uniform approach over there. Because even amidst that edit, the Fox News anchor with the largest audience, Tucker Carlson, continues to play very dangerous games. He has seized on COVID as what looks like to him another culture war ploy. He claims that people should call child protective services on any parents whose children wear masks. And now he's trying to project current media criticism of Fox, some of what I just told you about, back onto others. And he's implying that accurate information about public health advice is somehow the news taking a forbidden ideological position. This is just from his latest broadcast. As a channel, CNN shouldn't have a position on whether you should take medicine or not because it's a news channel. It's not a health agency. Why is a news channel doing this? Any news channel, a lot of them are. That might sound like a real argument if you're not listening closely. And we get it. People sometimes have the TV on while they're doing other things, making dinner. But this matters, and what Tucker's saying there is actually completely vapid. Seatbelts save lives. If studies show that, news channels report it. If safety experts and doctors... Tonight, the worst case scenario among the unvaccinated. We feel like we're kind of going back into battle again, and it's definitely, um, it's, it's definitely a, another wave. The highly contagious Delta variant fueling a surge of new cases across the country. Dire warnings from the nation's top doctor. Going into the fall with the Delta variant, we could have a really serious problem with a considerable surge of infections. The variant sweeping through the south. Texas, Arkansas, and Florida accounting for 40% of new cases in the country. But in Miami, thousands packing a stadium for a live concert. You're literally like drowning in people. As the CDC now says, they could recommend masks for the fully vaccinated indoors, joining cities like Los Angeles, St. Louis, and New Orleans. But in Arkansas, a new law banning mask mandates goes into effect this week. It's important not to have the current debate about mask wearing, but to have the current emphasis on getting a vaccine. Only 49% of the country is fully vaccinated. Those without the shots making up 99.5% of COVID deaths. Frontline workers once again with urgent pleas to the public. We are seeing younger patients, all unvaccinated, um, that are sicker. Dr. Michael Golding has been working in the COVID ward in Fayetteville, Arkansas, since the start of the pandemic. He's seeing more COVID patients now than ever before. What would it mean to you and your colleagues if more people got vaccinated? Less pain and suffering and call less families um, to tell them their, their loved ones didn't make it. That's Linda Mercer's greatest fear. She's a grandmother now fighting for her life. I'm admitting my wrong because I was being selfish by not getting vaccinated. It really changes your outlook on life when you almost feel like I may be called home. Here in Illinois, the Delta variant has caused cases to double in the last two weeks. The governor and the mayor of Chicago saying that new restrictions could be reimposed.
thinking about going solar, but not sure whether it's worth it for your home? Well, before you get close, there are three things you need to know about going solar and one easy way to find them out. Number one, you need to Joining me now are my colleagues at the Washington Post, Carol Linick and Phil Rucker. Carol and Phil, thanks very much. Phil, I'm going to start with you. Uh, Trump was in Arizona yesterday. He broke out the, the greatest hits, among them being his rant about, quote unquote, voter fraud. Both of you talked to Donald Trump about this. Let's have a listen. And I'll talk to you about it on the other side. Tonight, the Congressional Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol has another Republican member. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi adding Illinois Congressman Adam Kinzinger today, writing, he brings great patriotism to the committee's mission to find the facts and protect our democracy. We will find the truth, that truth will be, have the confidence of the American people because it will be done patriotically and not in a partisan way. The congressman, a frequent critic of Donald Trump, explaining, I'm a Republican dedicated to conservative values, but I swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution. When duty calls, I will always answer. He joins Congresswoman Liz Cheney on the nine-member panel, the only other GOP voice since Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy pulled other Republicans from the group after the Speaker rejected two who had been supportive of Donald Trump's false claims about the election he lost, which the former president repeated in Arizona Saturday. When they steal it from you and rig it, that's not easy, and we have to fight. The first committee hearing is set for Tuesday, where Capitol Police officers will testify about their personal experiences, some of which even motivated their newly named chief to come out of retirement. If you would have asked me on uh, January 5th, you want to be a police chief again, I would have said, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm enjoying retirement. Um, but the events of January 6th changed that. Leader McCarthy slammed Speaker Pelosi's decision this afternoon, saying, quote, members who share her preconceived narrative will not yield a serious investigation. Lester?
and a writer and looking for somebody who brings everything to the table. You know, who brings the part, who brings their vision, and particularly who bring their brain to the table. So that uh, they're aware of what they're doing and they're making conscious choices.
have a lot of patience for people who feel like they're downloading from the cosmos. You know, just like, that's how it came out. And okay, great, now let's make it better. But, uh, you know, just writing from a place of understanding rather than from a place of fear. Where you're just grateful for any idea that comes along. And you don't want to change it because you don't know how. And, you know, it's not about the ideas, it's about how you support the ideas.